Good morning, everybody. My name is Crystal Ogletree. I am the Director of Enrollment Management here at Lick Wilmerding High School. On behalf of the faculty and staff, our students and families, welcome to Lick Wilmerding's virtual open house. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about our school community. I'm going to hand it off to our head of school, Mr. Eric Temple, for a hello and welcome from him. Hi, Crystal. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to just take a moment to thank you all for being here today and learning more about Lick Wilmerding High School. I love that slideshow. You just got a little bit of a glimpse into the really amazing work that our students do. Today, you're gonna to hear from our faculty and like all good education, our faculty is so central to the amazing experience that our students have. All education is relational and the relationships formed between faculty and students and among students is truly a hallmark of a Lick education. Our teachers are incredibly caring. They work incredibly hard to ensure understanding and to push and challenge our students so that they develop great passions in all different types of areas. So I wanna thank our faculty for sharing some of that passion with all of you today. And thank you so much for being here. And if you have any questions about the school, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Crystal, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Temple. I'm just going to share my screen with you and get us started. Okay, so this is the second part of a multi-event virtual open house. Um, so we've broken up our event into five sections. So we used to have an in-person three and a half hour event, but because everything's on screens now, we've transitioned to make it into multiple shorter virtual events. So we're trying to help reduce screen fatigue just a little bit for everyone. So as you can see here, our first part was on September 26th, where we focused on our school mission and philosophy. That recording is now available on the Lick Wilmerding High School YouTube channel and all of the future open houses this one and the future open houses will be there as well. Um, so this event is being recorded and we'll share it there as soon as we're able to sometime next week. Today we are diving into three of Lick Wilmerding's academic departments, English, history, and world languages. So we have a faculty member from each of those departments here today to share information about their department's courses as well as how they each engage our students with the mission of the school. After we hear from each department, I will lead a guided question and answer session with the faculty. Then we'll take a short break. And when we return from the quick break, we'll hear from three current Lick Wilmerding seniors about some of their experiences with the English History and World Languages Department. Uh, so these are lovely students you'll be hearing from uh, later on today. Um, so I'm now actually going to hand it off to Mr. Shank, one of our English teachers. So I'll stop sharing my screen and let Mr. Shank take it from here. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you should be seeing two of my faces right now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, as it says here, I'm Christopher Shank. I'm in the English faculty. Um, I've been teaching at Lake Wilmer Dean. This is now my sixth year, uh, 15th year teaching overall, uh, and I have some of my hobbies and email listed below. Um, I wanted to first talk a little bit about the uh, course sequence of classes in English at Lake Wilmerding. Um, it's fairly streamlined with two exceptions that are on the screen here. So all of the English 1, English 2, and English 3 classes are aligned within the grade level. Um, so every English 1 class is similar to every other English 1 class, um, regardless of teacher or regardless of section. Um, and that's true for English 2 and English 3, which has an honors designation. Um, the two exceptions are um, the senior courses, which are listed below. Um, uh, students, instead of taking a year-long course the way that they do in uh, the first three years, take two semester-long senior seminars. And each one of those sections has a different focus. The current course offerings are the ones that I've listed down below, um, but they do change up from time to time. Sometimes teachers will repeat a senior seminar and sometimes they'll um, come up with a new curriculum and, and delve into a new topic. Um, so the ones that are down below are just the ones that um, we're currently teaching. Um, 
there was another one um, called uh, The Fun of Fear, and it was looking at horror literature, which unfortunately, because of the scheduling changes due to um, uh, the coronavirus, um, had to be sort of scuttled, and so maybe that'll be offered uh, in the future. Um, the other exception to the streamlining is the electives that I have listed here as, as well. Um, so they, they fall into the categories of creative writing and journalism. Each of those open up to students uh, in the sophomore, junior, and senior year, and there's multiple levels of them. So you can take creative writing more than one time, you can take journalism more than one time, and the uh, curricula build on top of the previous years. Um, so those can be built into um, a student schedule as well if they have um, passion or interest or curiosity in any of those areas um, as well. Um, so I was also asked to talk about um, uh, uh, an assignment that I give every year, something that I think is an interesting um, example of the types of assignments that the um, English faculty provide for the students at Lake Wilmerdine. Uh, this is one that we actually just completed this year as well, um, but I've done it for several years now, and it's having students record um, a podcast in groups um, specifically related to this text, Death and the King's Horseman, by the Nigerian playwright Wole Shoyinka. Um, so just to get some background on how it works, um, the, we read the play first all the way through, um, and it's, it's a fairly tough play, so um, the first read through is just to kind of get the material under our belt so that we can go back later and do more um, deep dive into the, um, the tougher material there. So once we've um, read the entire play, um, students are broken up into groups uh, and they're given one scene to focus on. Um, they work really intensely, they collaborate with their other um, group members to figure out um, how they want to um, tackle this scene. What are the important um, topics for discussion? What are some really juicy quotes or passages to kind of, kind of talk their way through? Um, and the idea is that they will lead their own podcast discussion um, and record it. Uh, once all the groups have recorded their podcast for their scenes, um, the other students in the class will listen to the podcast. Um, so they'll get a sense of what the, um, the, the group thought was important for them as a sort of starting point of discussion. When we come back into class, the students in that group lead uh, an in-class discussion about that scene because they've sort of become the in-house experts on that scene. Um, and uh, it's just, I find it uh, a really fun and different way to go about um, the learning process rather than it being entirely teacher-led. Um, the conversations are entirely student generated. Um, there is a model podcast that the English two teachers uh, ha record, have recorded um, to give students a sense of how to go about this, how to structure it. Um, and then uh, they, they take ownership of the process after that point. Um, so I listed here below uh, several of the reasons why I think it's important to, to do this type of activity. Um, one thing has to do with the, the title itself, um, Death and the King's Horseman. So it is um, a Nigerian play uh, that is very tough and it's a little unforgiving to people who um, are unfamiliar with Nigerian, specifically Yoruban culture. Um, and so the legwork that we do building up to being able to process this text, um, I think helps students to read with empathy and with confidence. Um, both of those are very important to me and to the English faculty that as skills that we develop over the course of the four years at Lick. Um, it's also, I think, as I said before, a really interesting way to give students um, ownership over their own production of knowledge. Um, they do it uh, themselves. So rather than me imparting knowledge to them, it's them working to build knowledge with, for themselves and with each other. Um, so that collaborative construction of, of knowledge is another um, highlight of, of what comes out of this project, I think. And then finally, it's, uh, we spend a lot of time writing in English classes. Um, and so I like this project as a little bit of a break from that heavy focus that we often have on analytical writing, um, because there are multiple ways to show understanding and to show um, knowledge and, and demonstration of mastery. Uh, and so having it come across as a recorded podcast and um, a, a discussion that is student led, um, it helps give a fuller view of what students know and can do. Um, so that's important to me as well. And then one final thing that I was asked to do in, in preparation for this um, presentation is to talk a little bit about the um, student and teacher relationship at Lake Wilmerding. 
Um, and I used to think through like, what are the different relationships? Uh, what are the different moments, the different encounters uh, that I could share with this? And some of the things that came to mind weren't even the things that happened in class. They were the ones that happened um, outside in the real world um, that I thought were really fascinating. And so um, the uh, words at the top come from our school mission about um, producing lifelong learners who contribute to the world with confidence and compassion. Um, and so, you know, as I was thinking about how to you know, do this slide, that it struck me that that was really true when I saw students out in the real world engaging with cultural events, engaging with social justice events. Uh, and I've listed some of those below as actual examples of places where I have on accident run into Lick Wilmerding students. Um, these weren't class sponsored activities. These are what th things that um, Lick students took upon themselves to go see and go do. Um, and sort of that, that lack of separation between school and life or school and real, real world. But the fact that I was interacting with, with students in all of these contexts, um, that's something that it, it came into my mind as I was preparing and felt very special to me um, about the relationships um, that, that like faculty, like adults and like uh, students have. Yeah, and I, I think that is it. Um, so thank you everyone. So next up, we are going to have Mr. Viacanya, and he's going to be sharing uh, about the history department with us. So Mr. Viacanya, you can take it away. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the open house. So I am here to represent the history department. Whoops. So, cool. Let me start my timer. So welcome everybody uh, to the open house presentation today. Uh, thank you for being with us on Sunday. I'm here to represent the, the history department. Uh, so my name is Renevi Yikanya. My pronouns are he, him. I am in my 21st year full-time teaching and taught at Lick Wilmerding High School from 2004 to 2011 and uh, left for a little bit uh, and have been back at the school from 2017 to the present. In the past, uh, for the last three years, I was teaching both uh, 10th grade modern world history and 11th grade honors U.S. history because of a lot of realignment that we had to do to adjust to the moment. This year, I'm only teaching 10th grade modern world history. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do in the history department. Uh, so for the students on the receiving end of this webinar, if you end up uh, getting admitted and coming to Lick, you will take history at our school for the first time in 10th grade. You'll be taking uh, modern world history. In 11th grade, all juniors take U.S. history. It's uh, an honors designation, and both of those are survey-style courses. In 12th grade is when students have a menu of offerings of semester-long uh, senior seminars. And uh, there's sort of three basic things that as a department we try to balance. Uh, it's to have kind of a, a decent balance between seminars that focus on U.S. history and on world history. Uh, the 1950 to the present isn't a rigid cutoff, but it's just to uh, clearly communicate to students that we want to offer classes that um, are really going to ask them to uh, connect the big historical themes and the through lines to the present and to really have an emphasis on kind of understanding the world today and how history informs that understanding. And we obviously also want those senior seminars to come from uh, places of passion for the teachers who are teaching those seminars while also responding to student interests that they communicate to us should be happening in our senior seminars. So just as an example of that, uh, this year, uh, these are the, the semester offerings. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of the titles, but I hope that just through a quick scan, you can kind of get a sense of the diversity of topics that are there, the balance between US and world focus. And uh, every single one of these uh, seminars obviously lends itself to some pretty strong connections to uh, everything that's happening in our nation and in the world in this year of 2020, which is a very interesting time to be teaching history. Uh, so what I want to do now is share with you a sample project that we're doing this fall. Uh, talk a little bit about how it relates to some of the values of the department, and then I'll end with uh, a story about teacher-student relationships. So uh, this is a, a mini research project that all sophomores are being asked to do this fall. And it's their first introduction to research in the department. So during the three years that students are, are taking history classes at Lick, they're going to be doing a lot of research. So 
uh, this particular project kind of had four aims uh, to introduce students to research in the history department and uh, especially leaning on uh, our library databases, which are vast, to work with our librarian, Ms. Danielle Farinacci, who introduces students over a couple of days to guidelines about academic integrity, about research skills, how to produce a properly cited uh, Chicago style uh, works, uh, Chicago style bibliography all basic skills that they're going to need in any history class or social science class at the undergraduate level. And, uh, and then to give students an opportunity to connect modern world history content, which roughly covers the period 1500 to the present, uh, in this particular case to summer 2020 uh, BLM inspired protest. For this particular part, I just wanted to give you some context about how this idea kind of came into our department uh, of the many different professional development things that I did this summer. In one of them, the, uh, the teacher who was guiding teachers through uh, th that particular phase of the seminar just basically like called us to action and said, look, if you as a teacher are planning to return to the classroom this fall and you don't have a plan for talking about Ahmaud Arbery or uh, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and all of the protests that came up, you're doing a huge disservice to your students. We've all been in quarantine. We're watching these events unfold in our living rooms every single day. Uh, how do we like have conversations about that. So that's kind of what informed uh, do, doing the skills portion of this project, research skills, and connecting it to the real world. Uh, and specifically, I wanted to show you a clip from one of the videos that I used to kind of front load and scaffold and introduce um, this entire project. The sound won't be great. Just want to acknowledge that right up front, but I just wanted you to see about 45 seconds of this. So um, that kind of gives you a sense of uh, how in that particular journalistic um, montage, they were able to compress so many different things that were happening this summer, right? So as students, uh, the first thing that we asked students to do was to choose a case study, right? Give a brief introduction on how each, who each of these individuals is, and then choose one to study. So just to be transparent about like the thinking that goes into this, uh, those first folks right there all showed up in that video in this order. Uh, in collaborating with my uh, fellow department member, uh, Ms. Avino Kane, she suggested that we also include Sir Francis Drake, uh, since that was an important conversation that was happening up in Marin County, and Junipero Serra, whose uh, statue in Golden Gate Park, but there are many monuments to him because of his importance to California history, uh, to also include them, right? So as students, you would have chosen, or we were asking students to choose one of these case studies, and then to answer these four basic questions, right? So the first one, who was this person in history? Why are they remembered? Very basic information, who, what, where, when, that should be, they should be getting from reference sources like an encyclopedia, something like that. Uh, when was the monument built? And what does this tell us about that era? So in other words, why were people celebrating these individuals and kind of overlooking some of their problematic past? Uh, and then very important, why did people protest the monument in the summer of 2020? And what does this tell us about the present? So very important to kind of look at the world and connect uh, historical themes, historical through lines to the present, how do they inform each other? After answering those three questions, then the most important part, right? In order to repair historical memory and restore justice, who should have a monument built to replace the toppled monument, right? And I just wanna emphasize this right here, right? Repairing historical memory and restoring justice. We believe really strongly in the department that it's not just about learning how to study history in and of itself as an academic exercise like they'll be asked to do in an academic undergraduate setting. That's important. And it's not just enough to then connect history to the present and see how history informs the world that we're living in, but to really be kind of called to the moment, as I believe the summer of 2020 is asking all of humanity and all of the nation to do, knowing that all of these injustices happened in the past, how do we as individuals, as a society, as a nation, as a global community, how do we begin to repair some of that and move towards justice? 
Uh, so it's kind of a fascinating time to be teaching history, as I said earlier. And uh, this is very much connected to the mission of the school, which is about having our students feel like they can go out into the world and contribute with, with passion and with heart. Uh, so in the last minute that I'm with you, I want to share with you one of my favorite things about uh, teacher-student connections, and this very much builds on what Mr. Shank said. Uh, our Dean of Students, Ms. Wiley, wanted to offer something to our seniors this year just to, um, to try to assuage a little bit of the, the problematic nature of starting your senior year in this virtual setting uh, and wanted to offer during this week uh, things that they, could, um, that they could click into and uh, just for us as adults to, to offer something to uh, make our seniors feel celebrated. So this is my fourth year of being at school. These folks were all uh, ninth graders in my first year. So I feel a, a kind of a special connection to, to this uh, class of seniors. And I decided to go ahead and offer, I think it was on Thursday, October 1st, in the second portion of this, uh, a meditation and a check-in with uh, Mr. V. Kane, right? So show up for a guided meditation and a check-in, uh, especially my former Modern World History and Honors U.S. History students. And uh, when I opened this link at about 12.05, to be honest with you, I thought that I was just going to be staring at a blank screen for 40 minutes because... Uh, at, in that moment, I thought to myself, like, what senior amidst a really rigorous senior year and college applications is actually going to opt into a, uh, an optional Zoom meeting? And much to my surprise, um, seven students showed up. And when they did, the initial check-in was like, well, why did you show up? You know, I know that you're really busy. Why are you here? And the running thing for all of them was a very simple one. We really miss seeing our former teachers on campus. Like it's very isolating to just only uh, log into our scheduled classes and only interact with those folks for the time that we're there. And uh, not being on campus this year, we missed those opportunities to be able to connect. So um, it was just really good to, to see seven students whose faces I, I really miss and, uh, uh, and to meditate and breathe together and think about gratitude and then to reminisce a little bit about our time in the classroom and what we're appreciating. And so for me, that's one of the really special things about being a teacher at, at Lake is we have amazing students, amazing families who bring their heart, their spirit, um, their heart, their hands to the study of history. And after going really deep into the study of that, uh, afterwards, when we see each other on our campus, we just know we have this really special academic intellectual connection that, that fosters lifelong relationships. So thank you for being with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Viacanya. Next up, we have Ms. Zapatero from the World Languages Department. So I will hand it off to her now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today um, to our open house. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful Sunday. Um, I wanted to start with some, something I hope you like. Let's go. I'm going to share my screen um, and let's see if it works. So, as you may have guessed, um, I am from Spain. Um, I came here in 1998. Um, I am from Madrid. And um, in the past, uh, I started teaching in 1998. I started teaching adults um, a long time ago. And then I did several internships in bilingual schools in the in the mission and then uh, later on i i went to new york and i taught um, in the upper east side i taught right by the um, east river in this little school here and then uh, i came to san francisco uh, and i came to Lake wilmerton high school and one of my memories maybe i should start with that is that when i started my my first year at Lake, um, and I started actually my demo lesson. 
the students at LIC were so nice to me in the demo lesson that I didn't believe them. I thought they were pulling my leg. I thought it wasn't true that they could be so nice. Um, and later with the years, I realized um, what a good um, group of students we have. We have, and we are so lucky to have these students with such a good heart. And they are truly nice persons. I think that's one of the most amazing assets that we have in our school is the, the students that we have. We are very lucky. Um, I teach in Lib Wilmerding. I have taught most of the levels from 1, 1A, one 2, 2A, and, and 3. Um, our department uh, comes from different countries in the world, so I wanted to share that with you. We come from Guatemala, and you recognize the picture with the volcano. We come from Spain, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and then Dominican, New York. We went 38 up there, that way. And in our department, in the world language, we have three languages currently. We offer French, Chinese, and Spanish. In both Chinese and French, we go from level one to four honors. And in Spanish, we have a track. We have a regular track uh, that goes uh, from one to four. And then we have um, an accelerated track or honors track that goes deeper into the grammar, the requirements for speaking Spanish in the class um, are higher. And then this year, this track goes up to five honors that was uh, approved last year. And we are very happy to offer that. We are doing our research about the Maya and Inca civilizations. In that course, obviously everything is in Spanish and the students are fluent, it's an optional course, but many of them have decided to take it. We also have this, last, since last year, we also offer Spanish for heritage speakers. We realized that that was a need that our population had because we usually would place the students in a regular level like Spanish one because maybe they didn't have enough uh, grammar or Spanish too, and that, that doesn't really fit their needs. And we have made an effort to make this class to better fit what they need and it's really working. So we are very happy we can offer that in, during last year and during this year as well. Um, the graduation requirement for LIC in languages is three years of one language or two years of one language and then two years of another language. The students can double up in languages and many of them decide to do that when they are a junior. In, in order to know where you would be placed in the Spanish program, since we have uh, an, a regular and then um, honors track, or in order to know where you are gonna be placed in Chinese or French, the students have to take a test and is uh, at the end of April and May and it is an oral test as well as a written test. Um, I've been asked, like all of my colleagues, to talk about a project. So there are several projects, but one of them is, it happened a few years ago. I was uh, very lucky to take the students to Toledo, to Spain, uh, south of Madrid, with another colleague of mine. We brought 26 students to Toledo. And what we did is that we asked them to research first the sites where we were going to take them. And then they needed to do a PowerPoint presentation to the rest of the students of the group. So they could appreciate the culture where they were going to go. And then when they saw it, they knew what they were visiting. Um, we went to Toledo, so this is a synagogue, Santa Maria la Blanca, and they had to research El Greco, our painter from Toledo, El Entierro del Conde Orgaz. They had to research uh, Segovia, El Acueducto, and we took them to all, all these places. It was a wonderful trip. Picasso in the Modern Art in Madrid Museum, or the Plaza de Salamanca, so um, that was a very, this is El Retiro in Madrid. I think that was a very um, important experience for them, not only to do the research, of course, but uh, actually to go see 
Spain and experience a different culture. Um, another project that I really enjoyed, and I think the students enjoyed as well, was several years ago, I don't know if you remember, there was an exhibit in the, the Young Museum of Chicano art. So um, we took them to the museum uh, to explore these paintings. They did the research about the artist, and then we focus, especially during the class time, in the cultural aspects or what the paintings are reflected. Um, this is Carmen Lomas Garza. So these are um, paintings that are um, describing the society, you know, the Chicano culture in the States. And it was very enriching for them. Of course, we practice artist vocabulary, art vocabulary, and, and then, of course, we talk about the culture that is a very important component, especially in the higher levels in the World Language Department. One more project. Um, we have so much, uh, such a rich culture you know, in San Francisco of the Hispanic community that we have to take advantage of it and just to make the kids aware that it's in our doorsteps. So we have also taken them to Presita Ice. It's, I'm sure many of you know it's an organization in the mission where they explain to us uh, all these beautiful murals, um, and beautiful and meaningful. No? They represent um, important facts of our society. And we took them for a tour with Presita Ice. And then again in the school, during the class time, um, we had discussions about what they mean um, for us, what do these murals represent. Obviously I do this with higher levels. Um, like I can do it with two accelerated or three, three honors. Um, these are different murals. And, and this is a special mural because this is El Viaje de Enrique. Enrique is a boy who traveled from Guatemala to the United States to look for his mom. It's a real story. There is a book about it. And we have also been reading excerpts from the book, not the whole thing because it's pretty graphic and, and tough. So that's another way how we brought uh, culture and also immigration, especially during the last year, there have been so many issues around this topic that it was important to talk about them. Um, and then um, I wanted to share with you, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna come out of this and then I'm gonna share with you another project that the students have, have done. And it's a biography of course, um, I don't see it right now, um, but um, in the, th these are projects that we can do with higher levels, but when, it's, um, when they are lower levels, maybe they don't have the, um, the language to, to do these kind of projects, like to talk about culture in Spanish. So, so one of the projects, is a um, biography. Okay, so um, I did this project in level two. Uh, actually, it was this year at the end of the quarter because now we are doing quarters, a quarter system. So uh, students are working in the differences between the two past tenses in level two. Um, in Spanish, there are two past tenses. When you see, say I ate, we, say, we can say it in two different ways. So they have to share their biography, the timeline when they were born, things, important things that happened in their lives. They bring pictures. The students have to ask big questions to each other about what these pictures represent for them when they were born, events import that have been important in their lives, um, other activities that they have done, or people who are important for them. Um, and this is a way for me to build community. Um, actually, I think that right now um, in the online learning is one of the most important things that we can do is to keep our community alive. And we have such a wonderful community of kids and teachers 
that sharing their personal story is important when they cannot see each other. So we do this for a few classes and they get to know all of the students in the class in a different manner. Um, I've been asked also to share um, memory uh, of the school. I have been teaching in the school for 14 years and I have many, many memories, but I couldn't come up with one, one only one memory. For me, Lake Wilmerding is, is such a happy place. It sounds silly, but it is. I mean, the kids are very happy at Lake. Everybody says hi, everybody, they all feel comfortable. One of the things that I remember is when the students cannot come for regular hours for extra help because they are not maybe following the classes pretty well and both them and I come earlier before the school starts like maybe 30 minutes earlier and how appreciative they are of that and how committed they are and what a special bond you build with the students when when you just do that extra effort and they do it as well of course and the last memory I wanted to share was during Zoom, um, I had some internet issues and I was kicked out of the meeting um, continuously in one of my classes. And my surprise was when I came back, not only that all the students were there that maybe I wouldn't have been there if I was a teen, but when I came back, um, they were talking about the different ways where we could still be learning if I was kicked out of the Zoom meeting. So they were talking about maybe Ms. Zapatero, we can all work in a Google Doc. You can give us the link of that short video and then we can watch it and then write a paragraph in the two past tenses. We can go to this website you told us about conjugations. And I was in complete um, disbelief um, about their dedication to, to learning and the commitment. And, and that's it with my presentation. Thanks again so much for, for coming. Thank you, Ms. Zapatero. So now I am going to lead us in a guided question and answer session. Um, I want to thank everybody who submitted questions this week. We received almost 100 questions. Um, so in order to use this time most efficiently, um, my colleague Min and I, we read through all of the submitted questions and we chose a few to ask today. Um, some right now to our faculty and then some later on to our students. So we're going to ask some questions that represented the most common themes that came up in the questions being submitted. So if your question doesn't get asked today, please feel free to email admissions at lwhs.org and we'll answer it there or connect you with someone who will answer it. Um, and other opportunities for asking questions include our admissions office hours, which happen every Tuesday morning, and our student-led virtual campus tours, which happen every Thursday around lunchtime. So there's a lot of opportunities to ask questions if, if we don't get to yours today. Um, so to start us off, I will start with a question for you, Ms. Zapatero, about language learning. Um, so how does the department approach language learning? What method do students use? So if you could just talk a little bit more about whether it's a lot of conversation, focus on culture, um, just a little bit more about how, how language is taught. So um, at LEAC, we are very lucky to have workshops where we can attend every year and learn different skills about how to teach languages. So thanks to that, we have learned different ways. And in the beginners levels, we do a lot of conversations. So it's mostly focused on communication skills. So for example, at the end of this quarter, they can already ask for directions or restaurant or store, how to ask for clothing. So it's very practical and focused on communication. We also work on stories. So some, for some students, it's easier to learn with reading and listening to stories and then writing in a similar manner. We also do in the beginners a lot of TPR. I don't, it's like teaching with physical activities. So you associate gestures with actions for those students that are more kinesthetic. And we try to do a lot of movement in the beginners, like freshmen especially or sophomores. 
And after that, in the more higher levels, we are focused more in literature, uh, culture, like in the Spanish four, for example, and, and then the Hispanic civilizations. So um, it's mostly communicative at the beginning. Perfect, thank you. Um, next, we'll go with the history question for Mr. Viacanya. Um, and it looks like this question was probably submitted by a parent. So it reads, my education was very America slash hero centric, but the world has become and is continuing to become much more global. What is Lick doing to prepare students for that reality? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it, I, I could say a lot about it. Uh, I guess my, my first initial response would be to say that uh, it makes sense that many of our history educations were very American-centric, very Eurocentric, because if we look at the discipline of history and how it came about, uh, going all the way back to antiquity, Herodotus, the, uh, as has Eurocentrically been called, the father of history, right? I mean, he was the father of history for the ancient Greeks, for one city-state, but that's not how the Persians or uh, kingdoms in Africa or the peoples of the Americas or anybody in East Asia or in what today we would call the Middle East, that wasn't their uh, original historian, right? So history has always been global, uh, but specifically in an academic setting at the university level in the late 19th century, who were the inventors of the discipline of history? Uh, it was a very, very particular intersectionality of identities that defined all of that. And it was those historians who trained generations of historians all the way until about the mid 20th century that established this kind of platform of in American history. It's very much a, like, go USA, we're the greatest country in the world, American exceptionalism. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? There was also like a lot of civics education and patriotism and like pro-nationalism built into that. And then when talking about uh, world history, Oftentimes it was Eurocentric history, the history of Europe and how it interacted with all of its peoples. So how do we make sense of all of that, uh, especially like in, in world history, is first of all to name it, right? Like this is the way in which the study of history has happened in the last 150, 200 years. So what were some of those like major themes of that Eurocentric way of looking at American history and world history? And, and then what do historians, and not just historians, but people from any discipline, from any walk of life, from all of the different cultures and civilizations and time periods that we study, what did they say about themselves? So in other words, it's not about having a single story of history, it's about having a balance of stories and a multiplicity of stories and asking students to reflect on the stories that they themselves have in their own minds and their own worldviews, uh, which of those stories stories are coming from their family context, which of those stories are coming from their K through 12 context, uh, which of those stories are coming from their own lived experience and their own life experiences. And so creating multiple ways and multiple pathways for us to share that multiplicity of stories in the classroom and to make sense of it all. And I hope that the project that I shared with y'all uh, during my presentation kind of gives you like a little bit of a window into how we do that in the classroom, right? It's literally the past colliding with the present to redefine the way that we're understanding history. Um, and the very last thing I would say in response to that question is also to get students to build a vocabulary if they don't already have it for being able to speak about uh, their own personal identities and where their own markers of identity give them privilege, where they have given them like historical marginalization, the intersectionality of that, how that manifests in a private school with a public purpose, with people coming from many walks of life and really building dialogue structures that allow us to approach each other with curiosity, with respect, with cultural humility. Uh, and so in all of those ways, we are fully embedded in this discussion of like, how do we talk about the past and the present? And how do we do that in a way that broadens our worldview and makes us curious about studying uh, more than just American or European history? Thanks so much, Mr. Viacanya. Um, Mr. Shank, I have a question for you for the English department. This was probably the most common question we got for the English department. Um, how do you choose what books students read for each class and how do you incorporate diverse perspectives in the books you choose? Right. Um, that's a great question and thank you for asking it. Um, so there are no um, set uh, book lists that we focus on every single year, but rather um, 
each year presents an opportunity to change what, um, what we're doing. And um, we often do make changes to try to adjust to what feels relevant at the time, as well as to um, address what feels like maybe a gap in a, in a previous curriculum. Um, so we work on grade level teams and it's the responsibility of those teams to choose the books. Um, we have meetings often uh, to talk about this curriculum at the end of a current year, you know, at the beginning of the next year. Um, and I would say that, that one of the sort of safeguards that we built in is um, a lot of focus on mission. Um, so both the school's mission and um, every grade level in the English department has a grade level mission. And so when we're deciding on the books that we want to include or the other texts that we want to include, um, we often go back to the mission and see if that aligns. Um, and so, you know, one part of the school's mission is about the um, the many walks of life that Mr. Biakanya just mentioned as well. And so we think about the diversity of, of lives that are entering, coming into the school. And then another part of the mission is walking out into the world with um, confidence and compassion. And so we think about what are the many different places in the world that leaving like Wilmerding students will encounter. And so, um, you know, going back to that mission focus helps us to remember um, sort of the need for diversity and um, it, it helps us to slow down and, and, and parse that in, or, you know, work that into our, um, our decision-making process when we're, we're coming up with the books and the curriculum. Um, just a, a small addendum, um, I didn't mention before when I talked to um, English 1, 2, and 3, um, English 2 tends to have a world literature focus. Um, and English 3 is more focused on American literature. Uh, English 1 is a little bit more skill and genre focused, um, and so it'll be more, you know, here's, here's how we study short stories, here's how we study poetry. Um, and so in, in English 2, um, which I've taught every year that I've, I've been at Lick, um, with that world literature focus, um, it's, it's, you know, top of mind. Um, how do we try to um, incorporate and teach to these, you know, diverse contexts? Um, so that in that year, especially, um, it is never absent from the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Shank, Mr. Villacana, and Ms. Zapatero. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Like I mentioned earlier, some more of your questions will get answered later in the event um, by, by our student panels. Um, also, I just want to mention that where the open house recordings will be on the Lick Wilmerding YouTube channel, um, we all also have short department videos, so about two, three minute videos for each department where they talk a, a different faculty member talks a little bit more about their, their department philosophy, so be sure to check those out too. Welcome back everybody. I am now going to hand it off to my colleague, Mr. Min Yu, who will be leading the next portion of our event. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, my name is Min, the students call me Mr. Min, and I am the Associate Director of Admissions here at Lick Um I'm joined today by three current seniors who are going to share a little bit about their experiences at Lick uh, with a particular focus on English history and world language. So if we could just start by having each of you introduce yourselves quickly by just saying your name, what middle school you went to, and a brief overview of the ways that you're involved in the Lick Wilmerding community. Um, so can we start with uh, Teresa? Hi everyone, um, I'm Teresa. I went to Parkway Middle School um, and some of the things I'm involved with at Lick are I'm an admissions intern, I'm a leader, a co-leader for Environmental Club, I'm also a co-leader for the Senegal Service Learning Club, and um, I'm also affiliated with um, some of the center volunteer things. Um, I'm a part of the visual arts program, so I've taken a lot of courses in that. Um, yeah, just in general, um, I'm someone who's very affiliated with the Lick community. Primo. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Primo. Um, as Mr. Min said, I'm a senior, and I went to Honolulu Waldorf School in Hawaii. I am on student council. I'm student inclusion chair this year. I'm also an editor of our school's newspaper and literary magazine, and I'm also one of the leaders for um, one of our queer affinity spaces on campus. Last but not least, Margaret. Hi everyone, I'm Margaret. I went to Case or Chinese American International School. At Lick, I play field hockey, soccer, and lacrosse. I'm also on student council with Primo, and um, I'm also a leader of El Wow, which is Lick Wilmerding Organization, 
women it's licks female affinity club Thank you. So uh, kicking us off on the panel portion of this event will be Margaret, who's going to share a little bit about her experience with the World Language Program. So take it away, Margaret. Yeah, so as I just said, I went to Chinese American International School. So I've been studying Mandarin since kindergarten. So coming to Lick, I was really excited to learn something new and try a new language. So I started learning Spanish my freshman year, which I'm really happy that I did. It's become one of my favorite subjects at Lick. What I really love about the Spanish um, classes that I've taken at Lick is that there's not just a focus on, you know, like grammar and conjugation and things like that. There's also a really big focus on Spanish speaking countries, culture and art and holidays and traditions. And that's been super eye opening for me because, you know, before Lick, I really only knew about Chinese culture. So I got to learn about a whole bunch of different Spanish speaking countries and all of their traditions, which was super cool. A specific um, experience that I can think of would be my sophomore year. We each got a partner and we got assigned a Spanish speaking country and we got to present about that country for our class. So my partner and I got assigned Chile and we made traditional Chilean ice cream and we spent a really long time learning this traditional Chilean dance that we performed for our class and I just thought it was super cool to be able to share my knowledge on this Spanish-speaking country in the language that they speak in the country. Um, that was just super cool and that's one example of many that I could talk about. I think that just one just came to me because of the dancing. I think it left a really big imprint in my mind. <laughs> um, um, and like this emphasis on culture and perspective has been a recurring theme throughout all of the Spanish classes that I'm taking and I love it, love that so much that my senior year I'm also taking Spanish. We really only have to take world language for three years, but there's a lot of Spanish speaking countries and I know there's so much more for me to learn. So I'm really excited to further my knowledge on that when I take Spanish next quarter. And then aside from that, I also have loved the teachers in the Spanish form and all my teachers have been amazing. My junior year Spanish teacher, Profe Beatriz, was amazing. She was, she's been like a mentor for me a little bit because I jumped from a non-honor Spanish to an, an honor Spanish my junior year. And I was kind of scared at the beginning, I let her know. And she basically was like, don't worry, I got your back. And the entire first semester, Semester, she was constantly reading, asking me how I was doing, if I was ever confused or if I felt like not up to speed. She would always make the time to work with me and go through any material that I was confused about. And by the end of my first semester, I definitely felt that I was at the same level as everyone else and that was because of her support. And then also once we went to distance learning, she was always reaching out to us, asking us how we were doing. If we looked sad during class, she would email us afterwards being like, hey, how are you doing? You look sad during class. What can I do to help? And it wasn't this weird like teacher student power dynamic. It was really just like a person to person connection. And she was really recognizing, hey, we're all living through this crazy time. Like let's support each other, which I thought was amazing. And this like teacher student support definitely goes past just the Spanish classes that I've taken, it's really been with all of my teachers. When I first toured Lick, like as an eighth grader, when I shadowed, I went to a US history class and I noticed the relationship between the teachers and the students. It was so unique and it was something I hadn't really experienced before. This just like person to person connection, not teacher to student connection. And that was something I really wanted in high school. And I've definitely experienced that throughout my high school experience at Lick. All my teachers have been really there for me and like have wanted us to learn that's something that i've definitely experienced they're there to make us love learning and they want us to like gain knowledge they're not just throwing information at our face and being like deal with it it's really just like they want to have a relationship with us and they want us to love learning so that's definitely been one of the most positive things that i've experienced at like thank you so much margaret um and next we have Primo, who's going to talk about their experience in our history department, uh, history program. So go for it, Primo. Um, I just want to start off by saying that um, my experience at Lick might be a little bit different from Margaret and Teresa's because I am a transfer student. Um, I transferred into Lick junior year. And before that, I went to a really tiny public school here in SF. And before that, for my freshman year, I went to a high school in Hawaii. So when I was looking at independent schools to transfer to, I was really looking for a 
place where I could find, you know, community because that wasn't something that I had really had in my first two years of high school. And that was like community with friends, with teachers, with faculty, just being on campus in a space where I could really feel connected to people. And I remember that that was something that I really felt because I was able to shadow at Lick and do an interview and do all like the traditional things that people do when they're shadowing or applying to high schools, even though I was a transfer student. And there was just so much care put into that process of applying. And I saw that it really was a community that I felt I could just be a part of, even though I was a transfer student. And it was just so warm and inviting. And I think that that continued even when I um, was amazingly accepted into Lick. And when I got here, I found that community and that made me really happy. I remember really distinctly um, being a little bit apprehensive for my junior year history class. It was US history honors, so it was an honors course. So I was a little nervous, <laughs> but when I got into that classroom space, everyone was really welcoming, it was really amazing. And I remember really distinctly that I just clicked with my US history teacher, Miss Gusfield. She was so fun, she was so amazing. And one of the first things that I remember was thinking that her style was like really on point. And I remember asking her about it, and she basically said that she felt like some of her colleagues in the teacher field needed to step up their game when it came to what they wore to work as teachers. And I just thought that was so, so funny and so amazing. And so throughout the year, we like bonded and we got closer and we like talked outside of class about history, not about history. And it was just a really amazing experience. And then I also remember during distance learning, um, she had this assignment um, with a quote that I'll never forget that she said that um, right now during this time that we're living in, we're like living in history, we are creating history. And during that history class, she had us do what she called primary source creation, where we were basically just taking time at the beginning of each class to write in journals about like what was going on in our lives, how we were handling distance learning, how we were like dealing with the fact that the world was in a pandemic. And that really made me realize that we are like living in history right now we are experiencing it we are creating it and that's definitely something i think that the whole history department at lick really places emphasis on is how history isn't just something that we can leave behind in the past it's not something that we can just forget about because it already happened history is influencing our culture and our society today it's something that has built and created everything that we're doing today and so we need to learn history and we need to understand it, one, so that we don't repeat it, and also so that we can take the lessons from history with us into the future to better ourselves, to better our communities. And I feel like both in my history class last year and in my history class this year, that was something that both of my teachers really placed focus on. Thank you so much, Fremo. And to close out, just the panel portion of the event will be Teresa, who will share about her experience in our English program. So go for it, Teresa. Great. Um, so to just give a little context as to why I gravitated towards um, Lick initially, I, um, you know, I came from a uh, relatively large uh, public school just outside of San Francisco, and I knew for high school that it was really really looking for, um, you know, a place where um, my voice could actually be heard and I could really be involved in kind of a community organization. And that was something that I definitely lacked in middle school. Um, and I just remember initially when I uh, took a tour of the Lick campus and I spoke with uh, Lick students individually um, and even heard from panelists um, all across the board, I really observed this love of learning that all students kind of shared. And they were just genuinely interested and super passionate about all of the material they were covering um, and whether that was you know the visual arts program or performing arts the shops or even um, the academic side of it I really um, witnessed that all the students they there for a reason and they um, really recognized that their voice is valuable and collectively as a community our voices were valuable um, and so that kind of uh, transitions into um, the English department specifically in my experience with that um, like I said, I came from a relatively large um, public middle school. And so my experience with English um, definitely felt 
kind of different from um, that of my um, peers. I remember coming in and just thinking that like all of my classmates were super sophisticated and really well spoken and they know they knew exactly like what to write about or um, and I was just really intimidated initially um, but I was also met with such an amazing support system um, from my teacher and from the rest of my peers. And I really um, recognized that no one was coming into Lick um, with this idea of like being competitive or, you know, despite uh, the high school process kind of being this competitive process, um, I definitely didn't recognize that within the classroom. And I felt that it was a really safe space. Um, and there I uh, witnessed myself flourish. I kind of, um, I I quickly kind of adapted these new skill sets and I learned how to um, kind of explore the text further and read in between the lines and look for meaning. Um, and I found myself even kind of annotating um, books that I read in my personal life, um, which I had never done before, and just kind of searching for these themes and um, kind of looking for a meaning behind just what um, was on on paper. Um, and yeah, I would say that just throughout my th three years of Lick English, I really witnessed myself mature as a writer. And um, I think Lick um, faculty is really puts a lot of emphasis on looking for your voice as a Lick student. And I think one of the points where I really uh, recognize this shift uh, between my middle school experience and high school experience is, is when um, I was so eager to get feedback. Um, to receive feedback on my essays and whether that was positive feedback or kind of constructive criticism. I was always delighted to read it and see how I could kind of um, push forward as a writer and, you know, really mature and um, produce the best work, produce my best work. Um, and then uh, currently I'm in a um, English seminar with Robin Von Rattant and I've just had an amazing experience with her as a teacher. Um, senior year is less about analytical work or kind of uh, we still explore the text, but it's more um, your creativity and she leaves a lot of room for students to create their own voice and uh, just kind of create their own structure in terms of the um, projects that we focus on. And so um, I've always just had a really great time. She's, um, you know, help me kind of boost my confidence as a writer and really um, learn to tap into my creative side and learn how to find my voice and recognize that my voice is valuable. Um, so yeah, in general, I've had a really positive experience with the English department. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, I always love hearing students' stories and I just wanna say like what a privilege it's been to be a part of your stories. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, now we're going to enter the next portion of the event where we're, we're going to answer some of the questions that you all submitted uh, earlier this week. So we know we won't be able to answer all your questions with the limited time we have. Uh, so if you still have questions about any part of the departments we went over today or just the lit community as a whole, um, I want to urge you to please use the Connect with a Tiger Ambassador form on our Exploring LWHS page. Um, so that you can be directly connected to a student or obviously you can email us at admissions at lwhs.org and we're super excited to connect with you. Um, so we're going to enter the next part of the event, which is the Q&A. And the first question we have today um, is about the English department. So uh, what are some of the books that students read throughout their English classes? and what type of writing do students do? Uh, so if we can actually just have uh, Margaret start by answering that, those questions. Um, yeah, Mr. Shank talked a little, little bit about the different reading that we do, like every year is pretty different, but overall we do like, we'll do poetry in most classes and short stories along with bigger books. We've done more traditional books and less lesser known books. One of my favorites was probably The Scarlet Letter, which we read in my junior year. And I really like that because the essay that we wrote along with that, we got a lot of creative freedom on it. And I think as like I became an upperclassman, I noticed more creative freedom that we got with our essays. And I got to connect The Scarlet Letter to Easy A, the movie with Emma Stone that's loosely based off of The Scarlet Letter, which I thought was such a cool thing that I was able to do. And I was able to talk about like feminism in the two texts and connect them to each other, which was such a unique writing opportunity that I got to do. Um, and that's one example of many that we just 
of the creative freedom that we get. Everybody wrote completely different essays about Scarlet Letter. If I could just like add on to that a little bit, I definitely think that even outside of the classroom, there's a lot of opportunities for students to explore different kinds of writing. So like in English classes, like you'll get to do literary analysis, creative writing, um, and especially when you get to your senior year, the variety of English classes that exist enable students to explore lots of different types of writing. But there are also opportunities like if you didn't get to write as much poetry as you maybe wanted to in class, you can submit to our literary magazine on campus. If you want to try like journalism writing, you can submit to the Paper Tiger on campus. And so there's a lot of different opportunities um, to get peer feedback and also teacher feedback because they both have faculty advisors um, on just exploring different kinds of writing that you might not have tried before. Okay, um, so we have another question um, about the history department. And uh, the question is, do students learn history in an engaging way? What are some examples of engaging projects students have done in the past to understand history? Um, so Teresa, if you can start. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of instances that I can think of um, where we've learned history in an engaging way, um, whether that was debates or fishbowl discussions or, you know, um, the like many different projects we kind of handled in history. But to be a little bit more specific, um, my junior year, uh, for my history class specifically, and I'm pretty sure this was across all um, junior year history classes, we had a um, this kind of case study, or not necessarily a case study, but a research paper. Um, and rather than it being on like a specific topic, all students were able to um, have a lot of freedom in kind of what they wanted to research specifically. And so um, the like umbrella term was just the Gilded Age. Um, but to push further, um, every student kind of picked something that they were passionate about um, and then went with it and there was a lot of flexibility on kind of the time frame too um, for my teacher specifically um, we could kind of go a decade before the Gilded Era or a decade after and that was no problem and um, I know students who focus on like reproduction rights for women during the Gilded Age or the art scene um, there was a classmate of mine who wrote about uh, the furniture and like woodworking during the time and so there's just a lot of ways to kind of explore your different interests and connect it to um, a piece of history in the past and then also just um, bring that more towards like um, kind of things that are relevant in um, today's age. I know that my topic specifically focused on child labor and I'm really interested in kind of um, social justice and um, you know obviously child labor in other countries and so it was really fascinating to connect those two things and see how um, our own history um, reflects kind of what we see in um, in present day. Margaret, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I would say another engaging project that we did that I think a lot of people will remember from their time at like in the history department would be sophomore year we do like a World War I simulation right before we start learning about World War I and we all get into teams and we get assigned a country. I think I was Klagenfurt, but I was actually Austria-Hungary. Um, and we get enemies, enemy countries, and we have to make truces, and we have resources and armies and things like that. And then there's also propaganda that we have to make, and we get extra points if we have good propaganda that during that time, there's so much propaganda for different fake countries on the walls. <laughs> and you walk through, and there's and like I know people who made chants for their countries and whenever they saw their history teacher in the hallway, they would just start chanting their like countries chant to try and get more points, which I thought was super funny. And halfway through like the Archduke gets killed and then we have to decide if we want to go to war or not. And that made me so excited to learn about World War One and super interested because we got to kind of not live World War One, but kind of have an experience similar to what we were going to start learning about and I think that made everyone really excited and interested to learn about like World War One because we were like having that same experience. So things like that we do not nothing that crazy aside from that one but similar things we'll do to get us excited about learning what we're talking about which I think is yeah, that's what that is. Usually about this time for like open houses, if we were having them on campus, we just see all these flyers and I was always wondering what that was. So thank, thank you for letting me know. 
Um, so the next question that we have is uh, about a world languages department. Will students who have never taken a world language feel behind from the start? Um, so Teresa, can you uh, answer that? Because I know um, that was you know something that you had experienced. Yeah. Um, so I came into the world language department taking French. Um, and I had absolutely no experience taking French beforehand, um, you know, aside from maybe listening to one or two French songs, I really um, didn't know much about the language. Um, but yeah, just from the start, I was really welcomed into uh, the department. It was a pretty small class. Um, well, all the classes are small, but it was just one um, single French class. And I noticed a really great support system for my teacher and for my other peers. Um, my teacher did a really good job the first kind of opening weeks, just um, in introducing us to the French language. I remember one project where we just kind of yelled out different words that sounded French that we use in English and um, she would tell us if they were French or not. And so I kind of learned how much French I actually use, um, you know, in my everyday language. Um, and from there, you know, it, the pace was very reasonable. I never felt um, like I couldn't manage the work. And I also felt that I was up to par with all the other students. So it was never like there are a few people um, excelling in the class and everyone's left behind. Um, my French teacher was very adamant about um, having st allowing students to have a voice and ensuring that if anyone felt behind or if we were rushing into a unit that she would um, you know just kind of disregard the lesson plan and uh, have a re review day set up and we would do a lot of games and just like other um, kind of interactive um, like language um, projects so that way um, each student would be um, I guess like even if they had a different learning style, it would be, uh, it would cater to every student, so. It's with, okay. Um, and like, I think you can kind of expand this uh, question out a little bit, like in not just world language, in any experience, so like Primor, Margaret, did you have an experience where you were trying something for the first time? Um, and like, how did you feel supported in that process? Um, this one, I think I have like a perfect answer for that because this one is something that I had never seen at like any of the other high schools I'd been to. Um, my first year here at Lick, I took photography, but not like digital photography, like film photography. And so basically I spent like hours and hours and hours in the darkroom developing film. And that's not necessarily something that you would associate with like high like the high school experience in 2020 um but um even though it was really new um our photography teacher mr sanborn did a really amazing job he's a really fun person in general all of um he's kind of an icon in the lit community but he would always make time um, because some of the students in the class had experience with film photography before but like I didn't and so he was always open to me like eating lunch in the photo room and just asking him tons of questions about what we had covered in class and like using the photo room during my free or if I like came in or stayed late after school um, he was always open to me just like being able to explore and try different things and so even though I'd never had any experience with film photography before I was able to both learn a lot from Mr. Sanborn, but then also learn on my own through like trial and error, but still feel supported and feel like I could really embrace like the way I wanted to express myself through photography. And so I think that that was like an amazing experience that like isn't necessarily um, so academic. Yeah, I would also quickly add freshman year, we take a CMA contemporary media and art class which I was really scared for where we do drawing and painting and things like that and I did not consider myself an art person at all I was really scared for that class and then I went to it and they started teaching us actual techniques and I was like oh there's actual technique to this and if you actually work hard and understand the techniques then anyone can really be an art person and it was also they had an emphasis on like if you work hard and spend a lot of time on you know drawing and painting and things like that you can really make something super cool so it's also just like being open to learning new things and hearing what the teachers have to say and like by doing that i think a lot a lot of people feel more comfortable in things that they might not be comfortable in the past 
Thank you for sharing. Um, so I think we have time for like two more questions. Um, so to students, what do you feel is the strength of each of these departments? Um, so Margaret, kick us off, but like kind of quickly, um, what do you think are the strengths of, of the three departments that we were able to cover today? Um, for English, I would say what I've experienced is they really, and what Teresa said helped me find my voice and helped me find exactly what I want to talk about. And then on top of that, helped me figure out how to express that voice through writing and help me understand how to use, like make my voice powerful through writing, whether that be poetry or bigger essays. I think that's something that they did a really good job, at least for me. And then for history, people have talked about this too, but definitely the connection to real life, that's something that I think is super important and I've been able to understand how much history affects my everyday life which is super cool and then for the world language department um, kind of what I talked about before with the emphasis on Spanish-speaking language countries and their cultures but also I would say the vocabulary that I've learned in Spanish has been super relevant to my everyday life we had a whole unit last year on um, social media which is something that I thought was really cool and super relevant and something that I would actually use in a normal conversation in this era so yeah that's another thing I think the world language department did a really good job on for me Anybody have any new strengths for the departments? Something they want to chime in about? Um, I would add on that as a senior, um, I feel like the history department has really prepared me for college classes um, in terms of like the level of reading. Obviously like y'all might not have to think about this for a couple more years, but I'm definitely thinking a lot about college and what academically that's going to look like. But I feel like all of my history teachers in particular um, last year and this year were really adamant about like this is the kind of reading you might get in college this is how you can skim it so that you don't have to spend four hours reading a 40 page reading and they were really um, there with us in terms of like how to structure resources and like citations and bibliographies and I feel like Lick and specifically the history department has really prepared me for what I imagine college classes to be like. So I feel like I can really go into my freshman year at college um, feeling prepared and feeling confident that I can like keep up with the kind of academic work that we're doing. Um, yeah, and just to quickly add on to that, um, I think that this is kind of a shared um, like good quality of history and world language, but I think just this emphasis on um, seeking different perspectives and the value of uh, different perspectives. In my world language class, um, we, you know, we valued um, all kind of uh, countries that spoke French, not just, um, not just France, but um, through that I kind of explored really the value of hearing from, you know, people who have had different backgrounds than myself. And I think just in general, that's um, a really big, um, and there's a big emphasis on that at Lick, um, and then for the history department, um, just really connecting some of uh, what we, you know, researched um, about the past and how these unique perspectives kind of translate to um, the present that we're living in, and how um, you know everything that we're experiencing right now, whether it's the economy or um, you know the systems of power that are in place, are directly connected to the past, and it's not just a coincidence that things are happening right now. Um, so it's really important to seek that perspective from the past to um, make it relevant in today's day. Okay, um, and we don't even have time for this, but I think it's like so important. I wanted to ask you all this, so as quickly as you can, uh, here's a question that I thought was really lovely. Uh, what is a lesson you learned at LWHS that you will remember throughout the rest of your life? So why don't we start with Margaret? Um, I think, how valuable it is to try something new is definitely something that like has really like showed to me um especially our freshman year we take a whole bunch of different classes that i don't think a lot of high schools like have you take we do art and we have the shops and we have like rock climbing um so just and i've learned so much from all of those different classes and i've really been able to pursue what I've enjoyed and like done things that I never thought I would really even do um, if I hadn't gone to Lick. And 
just like how valuable it is to, you know, like try new things, even if you're scared, um, stepping outside of the box that used to be really hard for me. And now I think I've definitely grown into my shoes and been able to try new things and be excited about doing that. Primo. Um, this is a really amazing question. And I think that one lesson that I will always remember is how nothing in life is like isolated. Nothing is like just one thing. Um, at like I've had so many experiences where like I'll learn about something in history and then I'll like have my free, my passing period and then be in Spanish class and like see that same thing reflected, especially this year I'm taking Spanish, but then also a history seminar on Latin America. And so I think Lick really emphasizes how we are all connected and things that you learn in one area of study are definitely can be applied to other areas of study, whether that be like art and the shops or history and world language or math and English. And there's so many beautiful intellectual ways to explore um, interdisciplinary study and to explore like the intersectionality of like ideas and creativity and I think that I will always remember that and take that with me from my time at Lick. And Teresa. Um, I think one of my like biggest takeaways um, from my Lick experience is just um, their emphasis on how valuable student voices are and how um, these student voices together kind of create um, this really you know, diverse community that like is. Um, and I've just, you know, throughout my experience have witnessed um, meeting people from so many different backgrounds and, and just knowing that I'm kind of an asset of that community is really valuable and something I didn't necessarily recognize in middle school. So like has definitely helped me kind of find my own voice. Um, and I've seen that growth amongst my peers as well. Well, thank you for sharing. That's all the time we have for today. But once again, I'd urge um, all of you watching to use the Connect with the Tiger Ambassador form on our Exploring LWHS page to be directly connected to a student like one of our panelists here today. Um, or email us at admissions at lwhs.org to address any other questions that weren't answered. Now I'll hand it back to Ms. Ogletree. Hey, um, just one final big thank you and virtual round of applause for our three teachers who joined us here today. Um, it was kind of fun during a regular open house. I don't usually get to see those presentations. So that was kind of fun for me too. And another virtual big round of applause. Thank you to Margaret Primo and Teresa. Um, they are all seniors and like Primo mentioned, they have college applications they're working on right now. So I want to thank you. Thank all of them for, for joining us today. Um, so just before finishing up quickly, I wanted to remind everybody about all the different ways you can learn about our community in the coming months. So most events are open for parents and students. This, um, all of these things on the left side here, the open houses, the panels, office hours. Uh, Mr. Min mentioned the Connect with the Tiger Ambassador program. The student part of the Tiger Ambassador program has started and we are going to be connecting parents and guardians with parents and guardians in our community as well. And that should be launching in the next week or two. So look out for that. Um, and then the virtual campus tours and the parent panels, like we mentioned earlier. Um, and then just please explore our website. There's a lot on there. The virtual tour, you could read about our strategic plan, which was approved earlier this year. So it outlines our community goals for the next five years. You could browse the course catalog, learn more about the course, all the courses offered at LIC. Um, so definitely check out the website. And then just a quick, um, this is the admissions team. Wanted to do a quick intro there. Uh, from left to right is Elizabeth Tackett, Min Yu, myself, Jewel Sparks, and Andrew Manansala. Um, Elizabeth, Jewel, and Andrew are all Lick Wilmerding alumni, so they bring that perspective as well. And all five of us have short bios on the school website on the admissions contact, contact us page um, that include how we've been involved during our time at Lick, as well as what we love about working here. Um, so Elizabeth and Jewel, Mrs. Tackett and Ms. Sparks are both here behind the scenes today. So just want to give them a big thank you as well. They've been coordinating the tech in the background and supporting any families um, through email and phone calls. So special thank you to Mrs. Tackett and Ms. Sparks. 
So we hope some of you will be able to join us at our next open house, which is on October 25th, where we'll be focusing on the body, mind, education, math, and science departments. So just the final reminder, reach out to us. We're here. We're here to help support your families through the process. So email us, call us. Um, and on behalf of all of us here today and the rest of the admissions team, just want to thank you so much for your time. Have a good day.